Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, first plenary session with a really important topic around funding and opportunities for leveraging funding to improve the health of people who use drugs. Um, while you're taking your seat, uh, we will start because we are trying to keep in time. Um, this session is in very in interesting format. We have uh, four, sp five speakers uh, to start with that to set the scene and then followed by uh, a panel discussion with other people who will join us here. So the first part will be split in a general introduction around um, um, the state of the art and what the situation is with regard to hepatitis and people who use drugs. Um, and um, the funding picture provided uh, by two colleagues, first WHO and then uh, HRI, Harm Reduction International, uh, followed by two country examples from Egypt and Ukraine. So this is the first part. Um, we have 40 minutes for this, so we ask the speakers to keep on, keep on time. I think we have this thing with a little bell um, when you're almost ready to, um, uh, when your time's almost up. And um, I would like to start then with um, also inviting you during the panel discussion to participate in the discussions. So uh, we're trying to make this interactive uh, in the second part of the session. So I'm really delighted to uh, invite the first speaker, uh, who is my friend and colleague, Nicholas Luhmann, works on my team at WHO, uh, team on key populations, and his focus is predominantly on viral hepatitis. Um, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be in, introduced by Annette. And um, thanks for the organizers for giving me the chance to give this talk. I will dive immediately into it. Welcome to Geneva, because I have quite a lot of slides. Look at my topic. It's understanding the gaps in healthcare provision of people who use drugs. So that is, uh, should be 45 minutes, I guess, normally. Um, some uh, updates and new figures on mortality and incidents that I wanted to share. So um, we've heard already this morning that um, from our recent estimates that are not completely published yet, only the first line is uh, now public, that almost 600,000 people are estimated to die from drug use annually and uh, three quarters are still estimated due to opiates. We recognize that there's an emerging ATS epidemic and uh, for example, in many parts of the world, but um, um, these are the most recent estimates based on global burden of disease data sets. The main reasons um, for those attributable deaths are in order of importance, hepatitis C, um, overdose, HIV, and then the others such as hep B self-harm and road injury, for example. In terms of incidents, this is unpublished yet. Um, um, it's a commissioned work that we did with Peter Wittekerman's group led by uh, Adelina Artini. So these are a couple of slides on hepatitis C incidents from different methods. You don't have to look at that uh, slide in detail. It shows you all the data points from the different countries, 105 countries included, 247 estimates from direct um, um, methods and indirect methods. And what this shows, this is interim um, data, is that this group estimates that they're is 11.8%, um, um, so 11.8 um, um, new cases per 100 person years um, of hepatitis C globally with quite some regional differences that you can see on the slide, again from the same body of work, Bristol University. Then when they're using uh, population size um, uh, estimates from UNDCs and systematic reviews, in the moment it looks like um, the estimate would be that there's more than one million new infections um, of hepatitis C per year globally. And again, I don't have the time to show you the regional differences, but you can see them on, on the slides. Giving the population size, US, China, and Russia account for the biggest number of those cases. Um, and then very interesting, factoring in overall WHO incidence data, 
um, uh, in this data set, they estimate that more than 40% of new infections are attributable to um, 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 injecting drug use, and that echoes other models that have been done earlier. Um, there are, um, again, quite some regional differences with Af African region and Eastern Mediterranean region having less proportional contribution um, than um, the others that you can see on this slide. In terms of HIV, the picture is a little bit different. There's a little bit less contribution, but um, overall, UNAIDS estimates 10% of new infections come uh, are related to injecting drug use, and if you take out the African continent, we're almost at 20% as well. So for both of those diseases, um, this is a very important um, data point. So mirroring that, and um, uh, as we heard already, we have a new global health sector strategy um, from 2021 adopted by the member states. It is much more integrated across HIV, viral hepatitis, and STIs. In the yellow piece, I'm just highlighting a couple of main messages um, that came up already this morning and in other discussions earlier this week. It's really putting people at the center of the decision making and providing integrated person-centered healthcare, tackling stigma and criminalization. And it says it many parts in this document that harm reduction is uh, coverage increase is a key shift to achieve any of our HIV and hepatitis targets. Mirroring that, the first completely integrated guidelines um, um, was the key population guidelines, and here you see the recommendations for people who inject drugs. Um, I, I don't go in detail in them, but they include hepatitis B vaccination as well, uh, and pr uh, prevention and treatment as well as hep C, but they mention as well hep uh, mental health, sexual and reproductive health, and for hepatitis C, we have as well new guidance on decentralized integrated service delivery. What I really wanted to highlight is that these key population guidelines as well have very strong and clear recommendations from WHO. It is not just narrative. There are recommendations for the four critical enabling interventions, and that is changing punitive laws and policies that surround uh, personal drug use and the delivery of harm reduction interventions, working on stigma and discrimination, putting communities at the center, listening, to everyone and involving everyone and addressing the complex violence that people who use and inject drugs are facing. Back to the um, WHO strategy, just in terms of targets, I don't know if that is, you have to, um, um, can read in detail, but I just wanted to highlight that there are incidents and mortality targets to achieve in 2030 elimination for hepatitis C and B as a public health threat. And there's a specific set of targets for hepatitis C in people who inject drugs that is um, 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 down to three and two then in 2030, 100 person years. And the, we, you all know the coverage target for needle and syringe programs um, um, that is as well in the strategy. Now what is new, and mirroring that quite a lot, published just two weeks ago, is that we have a final guidance for validation of elimination and path to elimination. As you may know, WHO recognizes member states for elimination of uh, different disease areas, and now we have a guidance that sets the criteria. To eliminate viral hepatitis B and C, you have clear criteria what level of impact and program targets you have to meet. In the red, surrounded is the one for hepatitis C, and you can see that there's incidence targets specific to people who inject drugs, but as well to the wider population and then the very ambitious coverage targets uh, for all program areas. The path to elimination in this one is interesting, and we will hear more that, uh, about the use of that from the Egyptian, uh, towards the, or recognizing the Egyptian government. This has been done in prevention to mother to child transmission that when you can't meet full validation criteria, but you can show very ambitious achievement of program coverage, then you have a bronze, silver, and gold tier. And if you can show them, that means you're past, you're close to full elimination. And this is a way as well to recognize country efforts. And they are included, those criteria in that guidance. So a couple of words in progress and gaps in the area that we are discussing in this conference. The first one is that set from Luisa Biegenhardt's group published this year. 
the coverage of NSP and OAT, I think you all know that the coverage globally is quite low, that there's many countries who are not uh, introducing those interventions yet. The darker the color on the left is NSP, on the right is OAT, the darker the color, the better the coverage. But there's only very few countries with very high coverage of both of those um, um, interventions. There has been discussion if there's progress or not. If you look at the data, there are, is a little bit of progress. There's more countries who have low coverage, a little bit of higher coverage in some countries for OAT. The progress is completely insufficient, but there is some uh, movement uh, if you look at the 2017 versus the 2022 data. This is presented by Jason just before, but I find that work so amazing that I just put it in my presentation again. Congratulations, I love this data set. It shows us that only 50% of people inject drugs have actually been tested in the last 12 months for HIV and not even 50% ever for Hep C. We've seen the incidents, we know the burden, we know how disproportionately they're affected. This is a huge gap. And in terms of treatment as well, there's only one country, uh, two countries that provide high coverage of HIV treatment in the whole world from this data set, not so many countries included. Um, that provide high coverage of HIV um, uh, and only one country for Hep C treatment. So those gaps are huge, and the gaps are maybe even bigger in naloxone. This is a 2040 data set because that's just updated now. Uh, the new data will show similar, a little bit better results maybe, but um, there's only half of the countries who have registered naloxone. It's very rarely publicly available even in treatment services, let alone on the community level. I think really access to overdose prevention and treatment is a totally forgotten area. And um, it's just unbelievably, it's such a powerful intervention, but um, um, it doesn't get eno enough attention and there's a lot of barriers to introduce this, which is really um, a shame and it is strongly recommended. There is a specific recommendation and set of recommendations for WHO. But we want to talk as well about opportunities so one is that Egypt has used the gold tier, and they will just speak after um, myself. But I wanted to show this slide. Only 10 days ago, WHO has recommended them for meeting the gold tier, so that doesn't meet full elimination, but they have uh, achieved incredible progress. They have reduced in seven years, as you can see the slide, from 7% chronic prevalence of hepatitis C in the whole population, which is almost 100 million people, to 0.38%. This is an unbelievable reduction in a public health success. But the, <laughs> thanks. So they're the first country that are using our gold tier and inspire others. And um, not last but not least, they've been as well recognized for their prevention efforts and b because of hepatitis C elimination have introduced OAT and made progress in drug user health and in increased their NSP coverage as well. Another one, maybe not yet a champion country, but Nigeria, the most populous um, uh, African country, um, um, has started piloting NSP, is scaling up NSP. There's quite an interesting energy and um, um, increasing support from the Global Fund there. They hopefully will start very early in 2014 OAT. They have included quite ambitious Hep C testing and treatment for PWID in some of the Global Fund proposals. And so um, this will be very important. They're facing a huge drug um, uh, problem um, there, um, which is really um, of quite an important size. Vietnam has made use of integrated Hep C um, care in a global fund S have treated already 60,000 people, mainly people who live with HIV and people who inject drugs. And, um, uh, and they're writing a micro-elimination national uh, plan now supported by WHO. And you can see the good cascade of care on the right. So um, very good work from Vietnam as well in this area. And they want to take it even further and have micro-elimination targets. The UK is showing this, and actually the UK is quite interested to engage with us as well about validation of elimination, and I hope that other countries and, uh, and groups are interested about this validation guidelines. So here, just look at the lowest um, 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 column. Uh, the light blue is showing the viremic chronic prevalence in people who inject drugs. It has been half 
between 2012 and 2021. So there's huge progress due to their treatment and testing program. And in orange here, uh, combined from two data sets, that's the, what they estimate in incidence reduction and incidence um, trend over time in the moment. So they're starting to see a, direction of, uh, a reduction of incidence as well in this group. This has been shared by the, um, um, uh, our UK colleagues and is published in a report. There is a UNODC WHO combined um, um, overdose initiative that included a multi-site implementation study with the four Eastern uh, European and Central Asian countries that you can see, and that has really very good results. There's almost 15,000 people, uh, witnesses trained in the community, a lot of ampules um, um, of naloxone distributed, and quite a lot of reversed overdoses documented. So this will go to a training manual and um, will as well look at criminal justice system and humanitarian sec um, settings and is really uh, as well very important work again around this very important area of overdose um, that I've talked about. We've heard this morning, but I just still put it in my slide, we know it now, Global Fund has put harm reduction as a program essential they have highlighted that hepatitis B and C prevention testing and treatment is eligible, particularly for people who inject drugs regardless of their HIV status. And this is a huge opportunity for more comprehensive um, care as well. And this is my last slide, just addressing some opportunity and innovations. I put it up front, I just really think more and more that what Root drive through said this morning, if we're not addressing the legal and structural barriers and determinants of health, we cannot go very far. So, and it is recommended by WHO, as, as I have shown, and as we all should know. Um, care needs to be more person-centered and comprehensive, and especially in this area, we really have to work together. The other thing that I try to show is that reduction of incidence and mortality will be essential. And obviously, the backbone of that is extending harm reduction coverage. That is the backbone. That is what all really um, is absolutely essential. And then building on that, we can test and treat more people, for example, for infectious disease, expand innovative um, models of care, hopefully looking at a one-step diagnostics at some point in time that will really facilitate much more um, day, day, uh, one-day test and treat approaches. Let's not forget about overdose. Um, um, it um, is not often in those hotspots, community settings, peer workers don't have ac uh, enough access to it. The innovations, is th there's many, and I think we will hear about them in this conference, but there's innovations that are coming out from a unitate supported work, which is around long-acting buprenorphine and more person choice in OET, and as well if loaded space syringes can have an impact and can be feasible and potential impact on incidents. And please, um, if you're interested, talk with us about validation of elimination and the path to elimination. Um, it is a very powerful advocacy tool. And those are my acknowledgements. People who contributed to this um, um, presentation and many others who inspired me. And there's certainly many missing, thanks. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Excellent presentation. Uh, I have to apologize, I never introduced myself. Um, I'm Annette Verster, and I work at the World Health Organization here in Geneva, and lead the work on key populations and HIV, viral hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infections. And I would like to move now to my co-chair, who you already met today. Yeah, great, thanks so much, Annette. It's a pleasure to be co-chairing this with you. Uh, I just wanted to add one extra sort of comment on top of Annette's introduction, and just to give a, the reason for why we wanted to have this session. You know, I think there's, there's a number of us who are pretty frustrated with the lack of progress in terms of access to harm reduction services, also hepatitis C and HIV testing and treatment. And so we, we really, in this session, wanted to think through, well, what, what is the current context? But 
it, it's not enough in terms of what we've been doing and thinking through what are our roles uh, as people in this room about how can we actually learn from the successes and we'll hear from our colleagues in Ukraine and Egypt as two massive success stories of places that have really leveraged opportunities to enhance coverage of, of harm reduction services. So I just thought I'd provide that uh, some further context around that. So let's stop talking about the barriers and thinking about where there's been successes and use that to apply it to other settings. So I hope you come to this session with that in mind and, and what can be your role to help further progress in this area. Um, so with that in mind, the, the next focus is how are we gonna fund all of this? Um, and where are the gaps in funding? And it's my absolute uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Naomi Berkshine. Uh, INSU's had a really long, recent long collaboration, I guess, with uh, Harm Reduction International. Um, uh, Naomi is the executive director of Harm Reduction Inter International, and she has 20 years experience um, at the intersection of global health, drug policy, law, and human rights. And so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Naomi. Maybe join me and welcome here. Um, thank you so much. Is that working? No? Yeah, there we go. Um, thank you so much to Inshu, to Jason and Emma for the generous invitation. It is fantastic to be here <clears throat> with a group of people who are like so overtly committed to the elimination of viral hepatitis, so committed to person-centered approaches. Um, so I feel like it's just a little task I have for me in this next 15 minutes telling you how we're gonna fund all of it. Um, no spoiler alerts, but it's not an easy answer. So we're a little obsessed with the funding landscape at Harm Reduction International. We've been tracking the funding available for harm reduction in low and middle income countries for the past 15 years. For me, the funding landscape is critical because the allocation and distribution of resources is a proxy for political will. Um, and its absence is a major, major impediment to our ability to, to get up and eliminate the diseases that we so want to. Today I'm gonna to just talk about two things. The data and information we have about the funding landscape right now, with a specific focus on viral hepatitis, and kind of how we frame and how we are seeing the path going forward. So starting with, with viral hepatitis, um, in, Lance, in, in July this year, the Lancet noticed a lack noted a lack of investment as being a key issue um, in advancing the commitment towards the elimination of viral hepatitis. And this commentary estimated that six billion a year is required to meet hepatitis B and C elimination goals, and that the current funding stands at less than 10% of that figure. Um, I'm so pleased that um, in our follow-up panel discussion, we'll have Finyal Road from the Hepatitis Fund, who's really leading important work on, on trying to deal with that. The funding landscape for harm reduction. Again, a spoiler alert, this is a story of one desperately inadequately funded area of health meeting another desperately inadequately funded area of health. Since HRI started monitoring the funding landscape, the findings have been pretty consistently dire. Our 2021 research revealed that just $131 million was available for funding in low and middle income countries. Now, when you look at the UNAIDS resource needs estimate, this is just 5% of what is required. UNAID says there's $2.7 billion required annually, and that's with uh, measurements around the frame of HIV prevention interventions for harm reduction. We're currently updating this study. We've just started. We plan to publish our updated results next year. I think, you know, notwithstanding the fact we're at the INSHU conference, it's really important to acknowledge that to date, the majority of funding um, that we are able to identify from harm reduction does come from HIV prevention budgets. So, as the slide says, broadly, the number of international donors investing in harm reduction remains small, and it became smaller between 2010 and 2019, as a lot of major donors kind of shifted towards pool fund mechanisms, which are effective in other ways. And the total funds invested by international donors is shrinking. Harm reduction is globally is very reliant on international donors. The Global Fund remains the largest donor for harm reduction, followed by PEPFAR, the Open Society Foundations, and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. These top five donors fund more than $5 million a year. Robert Carr Fund is another important donor with the below $5 million 
$1,000 a year space. Importantly, our research also indicates the funding is, always, is not always necessarily aligned with need. You know, the data says that the most people who inject drugs live in upper middle income countries, and yet those are the countries that are subject to donor transition. That's where international donors are withdrawing. And then there's just 7% of international donor funding that's going towards community-led organizations, which we know is a critical and catalytic part of effective programming. What was really interesting in our last research is that we found that the split between international donor funding and domestic funding is almost equal. Um, this is fantastic for transition, this is fantastic for medium-term planning, because you know, governments from lower middle-income countries investing in services in their home country. Worth noting that either way, international donor funding is still decreasing at a rate which outpaces any domestic funding increases. So, looking forward. These are a few major shifts we expect to be reporting on in our upcoming research. I think we've already heard a few times this morning a lot of excitement about the potential for funding hepatitis under Global Fund Grant Cycle 7. There is lots of anecdotal evidence that communities and civil society made the case for the inclusion of hepatitis testing treatment in their budgets to the Global Fund, but all of that is kind of yet to be fully understand as we're really just starting that funding cycle. PEPFAR guidance included some new provisions for comorbidity style funding to incorporate hepatitis C. And in April this year, the really exciting commitment from UNITAID, the, 30 the $31 million committed by UNITAID for scaling up hepatitis C is actually like close to a 20% increase in funding in lower middle income countries. And for a donor to be able to come in and make that sort of impact speaks to the real dearth of funding we have in the space. And then finally, there have been, you know, largely alarming shifts um, from a number of philanthropic donors who have really important funding in this space. Um, Viv Healthcare Positive Action has been stepping up its funding, which is wonderful, particularly with an emphasis on women who use drugs. And broadly this morning, I'm so excited to see women who use drugs recognized as a core part of our response. Um, but Open Society Foundations has been, been going through a series of restructures which will really have negative implications for the drug policy and harm reduction sector. So we, when we think about how to kind of move forward, how to deal with this like vast kind of failure of funding, um, we see four pathways forward. We must optimize existing funding. This means ensuring that the money we know about, the 131 million at this point, is spent well and that budgets are fully spent. The funding must center community leadership, deliver quality, accessible, acceptable and affordable services. This also means continuing the hard work to be the most effective with our funding, with our funding in a highly constrained resource pool. This, however, never means not paying peers. We must support the scale up of funding from domestic government budgets. It's a really exciting area where there's more data and we understand more and more about how donors are f uh, governments are funding their own programs. It's really important in the context of medium term planning and withdrawal. And impo a really important part of this is ensuring that national systems are set up to contract civil society and community to implement those services. We need to maintain and expand international donor engagement. This means maintaining pressure for HIV budgets to prioritize populations and geographies where new infections are the highest, seizing opportunities for integration of services, and I think there's gonna be a lot of talk about that this week, and engaging donors adjacent to viral hepatitis and harm reduction funding, including NCD fund donors funding cancer and universal healthcare donors. This is, this is slow, long-term work, and, and I, I try to be really cautious as we kind of think about how to expanding international, expand international donor engagement, because we're not in a space where there's any area of public health or global health that is flush with funding. Even the pandemic fund is struggling to meet its targets. You know, this is not an area where it's just about like jumping into the next space. Many areas, including mentally health, are woefully funded. Um, so the last point is we need to explore bold new ideas. Sounds a little bit like a, a 1960s British self-help book, but I promise it's better than that. I think it's worth pausing to 
reflect that our efforts to ensure critical life-saving services are funded exist within very broken systems. On one hand, there's our current state of international funding, international funding for health, for development, which operates from a basis of a couple of hundred years of wealthy countries, all, pe all people, extracting and controlling people and resources, largely, but not entirely, largely focused on the global north, global south divide. Largely racist, largely colonial and imperial. On the other hand, we have billionaire philanthropic donors. Billionaires, for me, are up there on the list of things that should not exist but do, alongside the first three Star Wars movies, 5 a.m. flights, Swiss fondue. Um, <laughs> this is not to ignore the absolutely critical and pivotal role that philanthropic donors have been playing in catalyzing harm reduction scale-up and drug policy reform, but the very existence of philanthropic donors speaks to a broader problem in our society. We sh simply should not have systems that allow that disparity of wealth. So some of our attempts at bold new ideas are about working out what needs to happen for the future and plan for systems of resource distribution that are better, that repair the harms of the past and don't replicate the problematic systems of power and control. And I think that we need to hold that at the same time as the pragmatism that drives all of us. We also need the funding today to fund essential services. And this is where we're going with our new report. Um, we interrogated the use of international uh, development funding for narcotics control and aid budgets, funding uh, focused on funding that member states and, and countries report to OECD, so it's a data reported by governments under a specific budget sector code titled narcotics control. Close to a billion dollars of development funding was spent on narcotics control over the past 10 years, with the majority of funding coming from the US and the EU. We find this use of pu public funds to be deeply problematic because international aid is supposed to contribute to reducing poverty and supporting health and development. It's not rational to think that we can fund millions of punitive drug law enforcement and help and hope for a net positive effect. Decades of experience show us otherwise. So just a quick run through the slide so you can see that where the money is coming from, a relative perspective on this. International development funding is spending more on narcotics control than early childhood education, mental health, food security programs. And this is where the funds go. Almost done, sorry. In the micro data, we found this category of aid spending was covering things like enhancing intelligence-led profiling of passengers at an airport in Colombia, counter narcotics training programs in Indonesia, specialized vehicles for anti-narcotic police dog units in Iran, and so even some US foot donor funding was, was redacted because of national interest. And this is, this is not funding for development if it's redacted for national interest. So I think it, it's important to state that narcotics control has no place in aid budgets. I'm gonna close today. <laughs> Sorry, I heard the bell so long ago. Um, I'm gonna close today by sharing our Divest Invest campaign. This is much broader than our critique of aid budgets, which is simply us pointing to an area where there is more funding that's not being used in a helpful way. This is about being furious that we have emaciated budgets to achieve global health goals, whilst millions are spent on criminalization, securitized responses to health, and the war on drugs. We must divest from an ineffective and unjust war on drugs and free up essential funds to invest in programs that prioritize community health and justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, this is uh, quite shocking. And I, th I think the key question also later for our panel is how can we move the funds from criminal justice use to public health use? Thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, uh, invite two sp speakers from the Ministry of Health from Egypt as uh, uh, has already been um, mentioned earlier, Egypt being a key country in the uh, elimination uh, pathway. And um, we will start with Professor Dr. Wael Abdel Razek, who is the head of primary healthcare and nursing sector and the deputy executive director of the National Committee for Control of Viral Hepatitis. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would like uh, first uh, to thank the organizers 
for the kind invitation and to allow uh, to share our experience uh, in Egypt uh, with the elimination of viral hepatitis. It's a daunting task to uh, ex explain uh, 17 years of uh, work and efforts uh, in just five minutes, but I will cope. <laughs> Uh, this is the, the start, uh, how we were in 2014. We were uh, the fourth country in number of patients, but we had the highest prevalence. We had as many patients of HCV in, in Egypt as there in 38 countries in Europe, excluding Russia. With a population of 600 million, and our population is around um, 80 million at that time. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, you can find the diagnosis rate, and on the y-axis, you can find the treatment rate, and the bubbles uh, represent the number of patients. So we have high number of patients, low diagnosis rate, and low treatment rate. But this is not the case anymore. <laughs> In 2008, we had uh, a DHS, uh, which revealed that most, almost 15% had antibodies for, for HCV, and almost 10% had RNA of HCV. In 2015, this picture changed a, a little uh, to 10% of antibodies and 7% of RNA. In uh, 2016, the WHO committed the goal of achieving HCV elimination by 2030, with 90% reduction in new infections, 65% in mortality, with few words uh, regarding harm reduction. Then, in the interim guidance, the harm reduction has uh, uh, explained entity. Then, this is the dossier that we presented, uh, for which we are granted the gold tier elimination certificate and where the harm reduction has its uh, golden place. I will talk about uh, the pillar of diagnosis and treatment. This is the summary of uh, the 17 years. In 2006, we established the National Committee for Control of Viral Hepatitis. In January uh, uh, 2007, we started treatment by pegylated interferon. In October 2014, we uh, used grand DAAs with 1% of their price in the US. Uh, then in 2016, we started locally manufacturing our DAAs, generic DAAs. We compared them uh, scientifically, head to head comparisons with the original DAAs, and we found the same safety and efficacy. Uh, in mid-2018, uh, mid, uh, uh, less people were registering. We had a registration site for all patients who were aware of their diagnosis. Uh, uh, in mid-2018, we had lower number of registrations. That's why we started in October 2018, the largest screening on earth for almost 62 million uh, citizens. The nationwide screening program, not only for hepatitis C, but also for diabetes, hypertension, and obesity for all individuals about 18 years. In 2016, we had a screening uh, decree uh, from, the, from the cabinet uh, for inpatients, healthcare workers, prisoners, universities, uh, freshmen, students, travelers to work abroad, and blood donors. And this is the momentum of the, our program. Uh, and you can see here, so far, uh, patients who were uh, aware of their diagnosis were identified, then the momentum was lost. That's why we started our national screening program. Uh, for NCDs, for hepatitis C, then we added uh, individuals between 12 and 18 years with the pa parents' consent, uh, for sure. It was a multi-sectorial uh, collaboration between all entities, including the WHO, uh, uh, the World and the World Bank. These are the phases of the national screening programs. We divided our 27 governorates into three phases. Each phase has uh, fixed sites between five and 7,000 uh, fixed sites, and between seven, 17 million and 23 million should have been screened in seven months. Uh, we trained uh, 1,800 uh, TOT, then the training uh, spread uh, all over Egypt, each site uh, has a team of three members, a doctor and nurse and IT for data entry. And with uh, central databases that we, uh, we have a dashboard to uh, see real-time data uh, all over Egypt. 77% of the screening sites were in primary health care units. We had uh, 77 machines of PCR, uh, which with the capacity to do 27,000 27, per day uh, uh, PCR tests. Uh, it's a huge capacity with the lab information system connected to the treatment centers. Once the result is released from the machine, we see it in the treatment center. Then we were, uh, uh, the, the, the report of the WHO for the audit of the screening was delivered to the president by uh, the general manager of the WHO. 
and at last we have the HCV prevalence, not uh, on the governorate's level, but on the district level, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, as well for the, the adolescents, we uh, published it in uh, The Lancet. And I will introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Ragda, to uh, continue the pillar of the opioid agonist therapy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to be here today talking about uh, our success story in the, with my dear colleague, Dr. Wael, uh, either in elimination of uh, virus hepatitis C or uh, implementation of the uh, opioid agonist therapy. Okay, uh, as a continuation of uh, um, uh, what Dr. Wael said, uh, as you can see that we started a global screening campaign uh, all over Egypt, and all through the way we were uh, noticing and observing that we still has something missed. Uh, to, to think about it, we should uh, review that uh, the comprehensive package of intervention for people who inject drugs according to the international guidelines provided by WHO, UN, ODC, and UN AIDS. As you can say, as you can see that uh, in parallel with testing for viral hepatitis and treatment of viral hepatitis and HIV, we should have the opioid of substitution therapy, needle supply and syringe program, and uh, in addition to all other pillars of the uh, comprehensive package for people who inject drugs. So, uh, Although we have uh, the global screening campaign in Egypt, but there was an inconse inconsistent referral of people who use drugs for HCV testing and treatment. Uh, actually, this was uh, mainly done by some of the NGOs working with the key population, including people who inject drugs. So a more proactive approach to finding infected people who use drugs through screening programs was initiated. This is where we, uh, the Ministry of Health and Population has implemented the one-stop shop model where uh, the, uh, for screening and treatment of blood-borne viruses in people who use drugs. Under this initiative, actually, we have uh, established uh, specialized clinics for uh, in all addiction centers and uh, hospitals affiliated with the General Secretary of Mental Health and Addiction Treatment, where all these clinics were providing the service for screening counseling and treatment for all blood-borne diseases to all patients uh, of addiction or people who use drugs. Uh, this is a quick overview about the result or statistic related to uh, the screening of people who use drugs through these uh, clinics or the, uh, this one-stop shop model. As you can see through uh, uh, the last two years, two, uh, two 2021 and 2022, uh, there was more than uh, 36 thousand uh, uh, patients or people who use drugs screened for all blood-borne diseases and among which actually uh, the highest percentage were positive for HCV. As you can see, 7.1 during 2021 and 6.5 uh, in the year 2022. And also we use these clinics to provide vaccination for viral uh, hepatitis B and uh, more than 14,000 patients were vaccinated and uh, including the first, second, and third doses of the vaccine. Uh, as a continuation of this process, uh, we started through uh, reviewing all the results of this one-stop shop model. We realized that we will need to have an additional service. We, have, we need to start to think about implementation of OOT and actually we use all these results provided by the one-stop model to enforce the process of OOT implementation in Egypt. So His Excellency the Minister of Health and Population has endorsed high-level meeting for the tripartite committee, which is the one responsible for allowing or authorizing the usage of any narcotic substances for medical use upon technical recommendation from the Minister of Health. Here we are uh, targeting the political commitment, we are targeting the reinforcement of the government for the implementation of OET program, as this committee contains representatives from Minister of Health and Population, Minister of Interior, and Minister of Justice. Actually, uh, this committee has agreed in authorizing the use of OET as one of the evidence-based addiction treatment 
approaches or touches that adopted by the Minister of Health and Population in Egypt. And this is why uh, uh, on, in September 2020, uh, ministerial decree was issued to authorize the introduction and starting implementation of the OT program for the first time in Egypt. So uh, plan for the implementation, we, uh, an another high level committee for implementation of supervise, supervising the implementation of harm reduction program was established. This committee was chaired by his deputy, uh, the assistant minister of, uh, minister assistant of public uh, health proje projects and initiatives, Dr. Mohammed Hassani, and it contains representative from all stakeholders and all organization and entities who could be involved or who could be support the implementation of our OET program, including WHO, UNODC, uh, UNAIDS, and uh, in addition to other Egyptian entities involved in, uh, in dealing with people who use drugs, uh, National AIDS Program and Addiction Treatment Fund. Uh, so, uh, immediately we started by uh, considering a lot of pillars that we were working on, starting with uh, the development of the national guidelines for the medication assisted treatment using opioid agonist therapy. And this was done in collaboration with the UNODC uh, and our uh, national guidelines were actually adapted to our Egyptian context. And also we developed the national policies and procedures which provide the standard operating procedures and legal framework covering the OT implementation and uh, as a part, as a very important part actually of the uh, diversion control plan in collaboration with the UNODC, we have uh, the uh, consultancy of an international expert uh, who was hired to develop the, the MME system for our OT program as a very important part of the diversion control plan, which was actually one of our big concern while we implemented the program. Uh, concerning the staff or the uh, capacity building, actually we had uh, yeah, a lot of chances to have very strong uh, training programs for all our staff. We are starting collaboration also with all the UN agencies and we have uh, training programs on the establishment and delivery the uh, evidence-based high quality OET services. We, we were focusing on training all the person who could be involved in uh, implementation of, of our program, including psychiatrists, nurses, pharmacists, and uh, also uh, we, we were so focusing on training some of the NGOs and outreach teams. We were uh, conducting training for the uh, physicians working in primary health care or other uh, uh, sectors affiliated to the Minister of Health to be aware of the program, to be aware of the patients, how could they refer the patients to the program. And uh, uh, also we, uh, we will uh, uh, focusing on uh, gain, gaining more experience from other countries implementing the program, which are similar in culture and context to our country. And one of these uh, study visits which was really helpful was our study visit to Morocco after which we started implementation and uh, we were thinking as we can see that uh, actually uh, the sources of referral of patient to our uh, clinics or our uh, OET centers uh, depends on a lot of sources including the addiction units or clinics uh, distributed all over Egypt including the NGOs, uh, the centers affiliated to the National AIDS program, people living with HIV and all these uh, sources of referral are uh, referring patients according to certain criteria they have been trained on uh, to, uh, so these patients could have the most benefit from uh, our program or our OT medication. And finally, yes, we started on 1st of March 2023 uh, in Heliopolis Psychiatric Hospital, this uh, specialized addiction, uh, uh, hospital specialized in addiction treatment in Cairo. We started actually w with uh, first three patients who received methadone were injecting drug user and HCV positive patients. Uh, step by step, uh, this is for example some of the awareness material that we are using to raise the awareness of the general population and the families of the patients receiving methadone. Uh, and here we are focusing on uh, correction of some misconceptions that may be uh, present on, uh, uh, on the, uh, in the general population to reinforce the, uh, their uh, commitment to the patient commitment to the program. Uh, now, as a current status, we are now uh, providing methadone clinics. We have methadone clinics in four hospitals distributed in, th in three Egyptian governments, which are Cairo, Alexandria, and Suhaid in Upper Egypt. Actually, our choice for the centers to start 
where uh, was uh, mainly according to our national survey, where there is the largest number of uh, people who use drugs and people with any bloodborne viruses. Now we ha have 166 patients receiving methadone, and uh, quickly I give you some um, profile about these patients. Actually, we have uh, uh, more than 52.4 percent of these patients are injecting drug users. Others are using heroin by other method or may, may be using uh, tramadol by oral uh, uh, by oral route. And uh, regarding the bloodborne viruses profile, we have 81% uh, of the patients receiving uh, methadone uh, positive for HCV, uh, while we have 16% of positive for uh, the uh, uh, HIV and 3% uh, uh, positive for uh, HPV. Ongoing steps and on future plan, actually we're uh, about to start our second phase of implementation, including four new hospitals and four governors. And uh, already our procurement plan wa was including uh, propinorphine and naloxone, and we're waiting for uh, the delivery of the first cargo of uh, propinorphine. And uh, also we are uh, now already uh, some pharmaceutical corporations started registration, registration of their OT indications in the Egyptian Drug Authority. Uh, we are adopting the community distribution of naloxone and already started the plan of uh, its distribution accordingly. And uh, uh, finally, we have also some uh, local pharmaceutical uh, uh, pharma uh, companies who are starting local manufacturing of OT medication. As a conclusion, uh, Egyptian uh, viral hepatitis elimination is a success story despite limited resources. Factors contributing to success were uh, societal pressure for governmental funding, political will and support, setting up infrastructure for mass treatment, negotiating mass purchase prices, fully embraced or sub subsidized treatment for all, simplifying treatment decision and evaluation and low cost agency. OET program honestly gained national recognition and support in recent years as one of the core indicators for viral hepatitis elimination. And this is the certificate of elimination just gained uh, uh, last two weeks, as you can see. And uh, finally, let me thank all the personnel, all my colleagues in uh, either in the viral hepatitis elimination file on the OET program for participating on achievement of such a great achievement. And thank you all. Thank you. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, absolute inspiration to, to everybody. And as Annette sort of said to me as she was speaking, it just shows you how far you can go when you have the political will um, and the support from, from your government. And uh, hopefully you're uh, a catalyst for other countries in similar situations. So thanks for leading the way. Um, so now moving on to uh, another success story. Um, you know, I think the, the Ukraine has been, uh, in terms of their uh, use of global funding uh, has just been amazing in terms of what they've been able to achieve uh, in terms of harm reduction access. Uh, so it's it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Andrei Klepikov uh, from the Alliance for, for Public Health. Um, and Andrei, has a, a, he's a, the executive director of the Alliance for Public Health, one of the largest HIV and TB focused NGOs in the country and in the regions. And, and, and again, what he's done, and I, I would just like to make a, a special Thank you. We know how long of a journey it was for you to come here, and we just really appreciate your efforts to be here given what's going on in your country at the moment. So uh, thank you so much and a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, happy to present uh, Ukraine case study, the case study of resilience. Uh, just to remind that uh, while Ukraine is less and less on the news, uh, brutal Russian war uh, is going on, and it's heavily affecting uh, my country with uh, over 20 percent of territory being occupied, with uh, uh, causing enormous move of the population. 15 million left their home, so it's a, it is the largest move uh, uh, from the Second World War in Europe. And uh, you see that, uh, well, Russia's uh, 
missile attacks and drones attacks affecting civilian infrastructure so heavily. Just a data on the medical uh, facilities which were damaged or destroyed, we have nearly uh, 1,500 uh, medical institutions uh, uh, attacked. Uh, well, in this context, uh, both uh, government and civil society are working so hard to address uh, emerging challenges, uh, both uh, with a major focus, but also with a humanitarian support. Uh, this is an illustration that uh, uh, reality from, from our cities with also civilian infrastructure, including offices of our NGO partners and homes of our uh, staff, uh, alliance staff, and also uh, NGO staff uh, are damaged or completely destroyed with no uh, reconstruction. Uh, in regard to... Uh, key uh, lessons, uh, well, I decided to put it here rather than at the end, that everybody is fresh. Yeah. So, uh, and it's linked to the funding as well. Well, the key thing is also uh, to sustain the core, to keep the focus, uh, not to lose uh, uh, in, in the context of huge, enormous uh, emerging uh, things and other priorities. So, we are keeping focus on HIV, OSC, uh, harm reduction, TB, viral hepatitis, that's what we did uh, before the war and what our uh, clients and partners are, uh, require the most in order to uh, remain healthy and alive. In terms of modification of services, there are uh, several key uh, differences. One is in the uh, context of uh, such huge destruction to the health infrastructure. Uh, mobile services uh, became uh, so critical. And uh, with, the, with uh, my organization, we manage over 50 mobile clinics, so which now go into the liberated areas, to the areas closely to the front line. And this is a key, actually, change in service delivery model, uh, well, because uh, uh, many people doesn't require, well, hospitals or beds. It's also, of course, in severe cases. But in terms of diagnostics, outreach, uh, mobile services is proven to be so, so effective. Uh, uh, second big change is going digital because with such huge move of the population, it's so critical to remain in contact with, uh, with the people. And sometimes uh, chatbots, uh, hotlines, uh, <coughs> uh, telemedicines, and online counseling is working so well for internally displaced people, but also for those who left as war refugees. Uh, being agile uh, and responding to uh, emerging priorities is, uh, is so critical, especially uh, mental health, which is an issue to the smaller or larger extent to everyone in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, human rights, gender, uh, violence uh, is so critical in the, uh, in the hostile environment such as war in Ukraine. Be relevant is also very important because uh, we used to work in a, in a, well, uh, in a silo, uh, partially kind of uh, with the donors approving so-called service package, yeah, but if someone asks me for food, I cannot reply, oh, sorry, I have only a condom for you. Would you like to chew it? Yeah. So we have to be relevant, and it's so critical to be relevant in the war context. So this is a big challenge for civil society, how to find funding for this, because uh, we have access to these groups, and sometimes uh, kind of traditional humanitarian aid providers are so quite uh, high threshold. So if a drug user... Uh, come kind of with no passport or no paper with a temporary registration, uh, he, he or she can be declined, saying, well, bring your passport, come tomorrow, and the uh, person never comes again. Or even having the passport, kind of, uh, mm, uh, people can, well, kind of exchange it for uh, some small money to get uh, a dose. So this is also reality. So this... Uh, uh, importance to be relevant and to provide low threshold services. Uh, 
being innovative and, and is critical and it's the same as on the front line. We can win the war with uh, up-to-date weapons. The same in HIV area, it's so critical to apply innovations and share with other countries. We are getting more and more demands uh, asking, oh, Ukraine passed the crash test. We sustained the program, so we would like to learn from you what were key factors allowing you to continue. So I'll go quickly just through the next couple of slides. This is very illustrative when the war started. Uh, this is uh, uh, opioid uh, agonist treatment program showing clients uh, 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 quarterly. And uh, you see when the war started, there was substantial drop in services, but then uh, uh <coughs> a program uh, not only sustained, but uh, kept uh, growing in the time of the war. This is very illustrative, yeah. This is, <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is very illustrative for other programs as well, for uh, hepatitis and HIV and TB. But I put uh, OST, uh, opioid agonist treatment, as an illustration because it shows, uh, uh, well, the demand, growing demand during the war, but also ability to respond to this. And of course, uh, it uh, will be also further discussed at the conference with my colleagues also from the government, uh, public health center, which uh, lead on this program. Uh, also, several innovations were introduced uh, during the war, including mobile clinics. I, I already mentioned uh, uh, kind of mobile clinics using for diagnostic and testing, but also several mobile clinics started to function for uh, providing uh, methadone. So this is, you see on the, on the photo, also medical doctor with the, the window. We still have to sort out regulatory base, but this clinic started to function, not providing methadone on the streets, but actually delivering to those patients with uh, disabilities or with uh, severe health complications in city of uh, Kriverik. Uh, uh, another big thing uh, in regard to digitalization, uh, uh, from the first week of war, we managed to set up Help Now services with the uh, multi-country grant funded by the Global Fund. And so far we dealt with nearly 30,000 requests. Could you imagine? It's very big number, including you see on the left side particular uh, requests uh, 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 over 1,800 related to op access to opioid agonist uh, treatment we facilitated in, in other countries for war refugees, people who use drugs uh, who came from uh, Ukraine to other countries. So it's very powerful to proven to be effective and still going now as well. Demand is still there. Uh, well, another innovation was to kind of uh, move from traditional kind of NGO-based services to more online, online uh, orders and uh, delivery with a confidential, uh, 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 confidential fill in the form. Uh, so you see the figures are quite big and it, it includes tailored package. So you can order the exact number of syringes and size, also naloxone, uh, lubricants, condoms, uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis, uh, C and B test. Uh, well, life is going on even during the time of the war. And we have also the group of, uh, well, people still practice, Nobody stopped practicing chem sex or using some stimulant users. Actually, stimulant users went up, of course. In, in even some, uh, well, I mean, parties, well, even with the coffee, there's still, it's still a way to go on. So we also cover uh, with uh, support with services this group, uh, including with tailored package with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, ability of do drug checking as well. And uh, of course, uh, also during the, parties offering wider package like water and other things not usually covered in HIV programs. Uh, Naloxone uh, is still in huge demand because with such huge move of the population, well, 
people who use drugs are not an exception. <laughs> they also move and they buy in from unknown dealers in unknown situations. So actually, uh, demand in Naloxone increased during uh, increase uh, about two times, and I am so happy that we were able to address this demand. Uh, well, mini grants to communities. Well, it's uh, over 100, uh, 143 mini grants to be precise. It is very important to money go directly to the ground, to the people, uh, to address their needs in a more uh, flexible uh, way, additionally to the services they already receive. And, and this is an example like a friendly uh, ser uh, shelter for people who use drugs, because it's not a secret that in the standard you know, services, sometimes people who use drugs are uh, not wanted. Uh, so it's important to create safe space for those who need this. And we did, we, we renovated, so, uh, well, winter is coming, so it's another way of, uh, of uh, mm, extending the services. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, another thing I would like to mention, uh, during the war, we also used uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and it showed incredible results. So this is the yield uh, uh, AI um, program uh, allows to increase it uh, uh, quite substantially in comparison with uh, a traditional way relying on human beings. So it is, uh, uh, it is sophisticated because it's based on over 300,000 cases. So it's a good basis for machine learning, uh, uh, but uh, it's very, very, uh, well, I'm very happy that we are doing this and it shows results. Finally, as I said, uh, it's important to share, and I am so uh, happy that uh, Alliance for Public Health is also part of the program funded by UNITAID and uh, uh, Frontline Aids uh, with, uh, with all the partnership, including the partnership with the countries already, well, with Egypt, Egypt already presented there, and uh, Nigeria, which was mentioned uh, uh, as well. So. I think it's a powerful power partnership. We can share a lot among ourselves, and this is a big uh, opportunity also to learn from each other and to move forward with the innovation. It will be a special presentation there uh, uh, later uh, so tomorrow. Uh, uh, so finally, I would like to thank, thank all of you because uh, this success <coughs> is uh, uh, became possible due to well, team of the alliance, but also big, big and strong partnership within the country and internationally. So thank you, and together we will win. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine. All right, thank you so much, Andre. And look, uh, Nat and I made a decision to let uh, the speakers go a touch over because, you know, I, we, we thought it was really important to hear from your guys' experiences and uh, some of the, the only way that we're going to be able to do, to achieve things is to apply the learnings that, that you, people like yourselves, have sort of uh, um, helped us with to apply to other countries. So, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Maybe we'll now switch over the sessions. So maybe if you just join me one more time to thank all of our speakers for the morning session. Right, thank you so much, um, speakers. You were excellent. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of people will uh, come to you afterwards with uh, want to discuss some things in detail. So I'd like to invite the the four panelists, um, Susie McLean, Karen Timmermans, uh, Umesh Chawla, and Finjal Road. So we have four panelists. Please join us here behind the table. So instead of 40 minutes, we have 25 minutes for the panel discussion. Um, the objectives of this uh, discussion is to really mm, focus on the funding side uh, to make sure that we all have this in the front of our, of our minds and on opportunities, as uh, Jason uh, mentioned earlier. We know all the barriers, but 
let's focus on what has been achieved uh, elsewhere and that we can learn of. Especially country examples, some more than the two that we just um, heard more details of. And um, yeah, just how can we drive this discussion forward? Um, so perhaps um, we can just introduce next to Jason Umesh Chamla, next to him Susie McLean of Global Fund, Umesh is from Chai, sorry, Karen Timmermans, Unitaid, and um, Finn Jarl Road of the Hepatitis Fund. Great, so um, what we decided to do, because we do have a limited amount of time, but we decided to focus on, on four key issues. One is what do we think around policy and, and sort of opportunities there. Second, around pricing and market shaping. Third, around programming. And then fourth, specifically around funding, both domestic and global. So just so you know what's coming, that's sort of the format. We'll try and tackle this in the 25 minutes we've got. Um, I, I guess, did, did, I'll ask the first question, I guess. Um, and uh, this is probably perhaps to Karen, and then if anybody wants to sort of jump in. Um, I'm just curious as your thoughts, Karen, around what we can learn from some of the countries that are, that are making progress. And do you have any examples through some of the Unitaid work, perhaps, where you're, you're seeing really catalytic uh, potential uh, and places where we could learn from. And then maybe the other qu question, and either if you want to tackle it or someone else, is, you know, investment case work is really lacking globally. So is there an opportunity for, for more work in this area to perhaps drive, drive change? So number one, success stories. Number two, what do we need to do and what do countries need to do to make the investment case a little bit more strongly? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jason. And uh, I feel it's a big of a, of a big question, to be honest. Um, and the Unitate work, I think it is obviously still a little bit early to um, have success stories uh, coming out of that. Um, we may have some success in the sense of we've managed, I think, um, to involve communities from the start, and I think that that is really important because communities ultimately know best what they need and what can work in their sessions, in their, in their countries, in their settings. Um, I, I think on success stories, we definitely can learn um, lessons from notably the two countries that spoke uh, just before me, uh, but there are some others. Um, I think we can and maybe should do more work on investment cases because we could really make strong investment cases. We have very good tools, both for hepatitis C as well as for harm reduction. We have a lot of evidence that these tools are working. Um, we know that they are cost effective. We have examples of countries that really can, um, that can demonstrate that we can be successful um, so I think working on investment cases is important and more can be done. And I think it's also important, even if maybe that isn't fully the angle of your question, but it's a bit the theme of this session. I think it's important even from a funding perspective, because like working at a donor, albeit maybe a small one, um, Sometimes you have these type of situations where some money is quote unquote left over somewhere. And it may then be possible for that money to be put to use in hepatitis or in harm reduction. But you need to be ready. If, if a donor has funding left over, usually it needs to be spent quickly. So I think if you have an investment case ready that you may need to tweak, but you can quickly try to grab the opportunity when it appears. If you have to start doing the homework at that point in time, you, you might be a little bit late. So I, I think that is um, maybe one of the reasons why it might be important 
to work on investment cases, even if you are not yet fully sure um, whom you're going to approach or what your target audience is going to be. Um, I think another thing that maybe relates to policies and to examples, um, I feel it's important, and I don't know how, how to best position this, um, we heard a lot in the opening session about the importance of um, the current policies, the criminalization, and how big a barrier it is. So the obvious answer what we need to do is to get rid of those policies, or at least relax them. And if we can't do that, then I think we need to relax the way we are implementing them, because we are often ending up spending money on maybe not the most useful thing. And this could be... Um, like refusing take home doses, even though they could free up staff time, um, like the way um, medicines are being transported that can be overly costly, uh, purchasing the wrong thing. And I feel much of that can be addressed in one way or another. Like if we can't get rid of bad policies, let's at least try to relax the way we are implementing them. And sorry, I hope that that is a partial answer. Sure. Um, is there anybody else that might, would like to sort of add any comments or uh, around that question? Um, yeah, Susie? Thanks, Jason. And I would like to add a couple of comments. Um, from a perspective, so I work at the Global Fund and I'm the HIV prevention lead. So all HIV prevention for all populations, but with a particular interest and background in harm reduction programs for people who use drugs and um, and you know in a team that provides advice on HIV investments overall in an organization that's investing in a number of diseases and health system strengthening so to kind of be frank there the, as many of you will know who are involved in global fund processes at a country level it's in part a competition for resources, for scant resources. So for example, one of the things that we know is that the Global Fund's got something like five to 10% of the global resource need for HIV prevention. So it's all about prioritization. And in that um, prioritization paradigm, um, harm reduction uh, has a very strong evidence base, as I think many of us in the room will know, and I, and I think sometimes there, there is more utility that we could extract from that. Um, so for example, some countries propose to us HIV prevention interventions for populations where the need is not so distinct and where the intervention approaches are more experimental <laughs> or, have a, or, or have a less kind of clear and strong evidence base. And it's in that mix that that we all collectively, other actors, make the case for HIV prevention, harm reduction services for injecting drug users. So just to kind of extend Karen's point now, I, I think that some of us know that there's a strong foundation for the kind of cost-effectiveness arguments for harm reduction programs, but harm reduction's changing as more products are becoming available. Implementation models are... Um, evolving. We just heard a beautiful example from Ukraine of the evolution of service delivery for harm reduction in Ukraine in the context of war. So, uh, uh, so my view is investment cases always need updating and investment cases that apply to country by country are always more effective. So I'm a big fan of them and I think that there's much more work that we need to do collectively to expand the investment case for hepatitis C treatment. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. I think we need better information around under, to provide to governments to say, you know, this is how much it's going to cost you, but this is the benefits that you're going to get from that spend. And also, you know, for example, the folks from the University of Bristol have been leading a lot of work in this area, and so has Natasha Martin from the University of California, San Diego, to actually also consider the other health benefits that you get from scaling up uh, OAT or, or needles and syringe program. So how many HIV cases are you averting? What about long-term morbidity, mortality? Same with hepatitis C and same with uh, drug-related mortality. So I think, yeah, these cases for governments is, is so critical. 
Uh, I might hand over to Annette and we'll go slightly new direction. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. Um, of course, we're not going to solve uh, everything in the, in the 20 minutes that are left here. Um, but a conducive environment, you know, for policy, it, you've seen also the examples uh, in the earlier part of this session, how critical uh, it was and how Egypt, because of the political will to eliminate hepatitis, was able to imp introduce harm reduction while for HIV that had not been uh, feasible. So moving to the next um, topic that we would like to briefly address, on pricing and market shaping. I'd like to turn to you, Umesh, and your work at Chai on this, because we know that the prices of commodities are, of course, essential, and um, uh, where there are reductions uh, feasible that will have an uh, instant impact um, on access of uh, commod commodities. I think we've seen some examples of Egypt and uh, Ukraine of national production, um, et cetera, but could you maybe, um, elaborate a little bit on some opportunities uh, to reduce prices. Um, thank you, Annette. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving us, uh, or giving me the chance to come here and represent. Uh, some basic facts and figures, and uh, we've been here um, in two epidemics, both HIV now, HCV and, and HPV. Um, and those who were with us at that point of time in the early 2000s when the first drug uh, came out for HIV that was now publicly being available, AZT. And then finally actually came to the public health programming in LMICs in the mid 2000s. And one of the most critical pieces were about not only its availability, but the whole, you know, the, the whole movement of breaking patency as well as having generic equivalents of, of anti-HIV drugs that actually brought where we are right now. We have approximately 28 million people who are receiving antiretrovirals as we speak. And one of the biggest criteria to that is how you could produce, how could you reduce the uh, prices of that drug and make it available in LMICs and maybe countries that needed it the most uh, for it to really make any impact. We see the same thing now with HCV. Uh, when interferons were introduced in late 2010 or maybe a little earlier with a success rate of less than 50% in toxicity of almost 100%, I saw my friends, my colleagues sell their houses, die of HCV. And once uh, the directly acting antiretrovirals came into play, the introduction cost was approximately $750. Again, something that was perhaps very difficult for most of the countries uh, to actually roll it out at a universal level. We have the same drug uh, and a combination of uh, multiple drugs available with the help of the new pricing agreement uh, with the hepatitis fund as low as $60. So to be very frank, uh, any uncomplicated HCV case, irrespective of with people who use drugs or not, should be treated within $80. You need a dollar to screen. You need perhaps less than $10 to get a confirmation of viremia. You need less than $60 to treat the patient. And you need just 10 more dollars to confirm that cure has happened or viral suppression has happened. So there is no reason why, uh, you know, within $80, and this is just the cost of commodities. I'm not really talking about the delivery cost, which we can talk about later it should not cost more than $80 in an un uncomplicated case. However, we see the countries like Egypt, which we celebrate and, uh, and are really proud of, uh, countries like um, India, which is getting that treatment for as less than $6,200 for a soft egg uh, combination, $100 for a soft well combination, and we have countries like Peru who's buying the same combination for $3,000. And this does not really make economic sense at all. Why is something that can be leveraged, that can be made available to anybody who needs it from $60 to $3,000? That's the range that we're talking about right now. And thereby, the whole idea of market shaping comes in, saying that once you have been able to bring the prices of these life-saving drugs 
why is it that the global community and the countries are not able to leverage and take opportunity of, of using these pricing to get these drugs. So to be very frank, uh, pricing and the, co and the, con uh, and the uh, quantity of drugs are pretty much available. There is no reason why countries can't roll it out. And obviously there is a trade off for that. If they are buying uh, drugs that are five times, 10 times more expensive than what they could buy, they are actually taking those resources away from much more important things such as harm reduction. So if you are buying $3,000 worth of uh, a single course which you could have bought for $80, you could have actually used that $2,200 for the entry point for people for uh, uh, who use drugs uh, and provide harm reduction services because we know harm reduction services are the only way in a comprehensive uh, approach that we can reach out to uh, a population group which has the highest prevalence of hepatitis C. Right. And the similar opaqueness happens with harm reduction commodities. The price ranges are, are phenomenally big and there is a tremendous opportunity for us to shape the market and increase the coverage. Thank you. The one thing I wanted to sort of highlight, and maybe just an add-on to your comment, is I was so excited. I don't think that uh, Dr. Ragda presented this in the talk to you, but we had a policy day on Monday. And it's what's striking is that they are able to now, they're, they're purchasing sort of, you know, one liter bottles of methadone for $28, I think. And they're actually starting local manufacturing of methadone. So I, I, I'm really excited about that. And obviously the Ukraine has been doing local manufacturing. I think this provides a real opportunity to be able to get the prices down for OAT, moving off the hep C topic, to, to, real, to, to provide a producer for the region. Uh, so it's, I'm excited about that as well, this potential to bring the prices down. Um, maybe pass on, uh, or is it on to me, I guess. Is there, did you want to say something in that? No? Um, Can I so just say one? Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, I do apologize. Just nope. a small thing. Uh, we are having a session at 12.30 today during lunch where we'll be yeah. giving more uh, details of the market uh, and the manufacturing and the availability of <laughs> uh, harm reduction products as well as HCV uh, in a, the market uh, report that Chai produces. Kindly, if you do have time, bring your lunch and uh, get a little more enlightened. Yeah, that's why we're not going to extend the panel by too much because we want to make sure that everybody can get back at 12.30, get their lunch and come back if they're interested to learn around pricing of OAT and NSP commodities. I think it's really, really important. And then thinking about how, do you, how does that fit within your role um, here. Um, so let's shift a little bit. I think it's, it's totally linked, but you know, consider, considering the efficiencies and how do we have this, you know, WHO has highlighted integration and decentralization as, as key components. And Susie, uh, just sort of going to you, you know, what are your thoughts around what opportunities there are around programmatic capacity and building that through integration and, and decentralization? Um, yeah, what do you think there's in terms of opportunities moving forward? Uh, um, I think that uh, it's great to answer that question actually after the, uh, uh, Ramesh's inputs on pricing. When we think about, you know, this general problem that we share about limited resources for harm reduction, for hepatitis, for HIV prevention, for drug users, it was, it, you know, it's great to get Naomi's inputs about, you know, a, and money is being spent on other things that should be diverted <coughs> to public health. The, I, I really want to underline Ramesh's points about how critical price reductions for key commodities are in terms of the direct connection to expanding access. I see that, you know, like part of the reason why Global Fund was able to kind of be more flexible in its guidelines on um, funding hepatitis C treatment was directly about the price reductions. Um, and so, yeah, let me be super clear. And in fact, a, a kind of an appeal to the harm reduction advocates out there who rightly and properly, and may it long continue, the focus is often on human rights advocacy issues. I often think that our field needs to summon up some of the HIV treatment advocacy um, that was so transformational in reducing the costs of um, antiretrovirals for HIV to, to kind of remind ourselves that many countries are paying too much for some basic and the new HM harm reduction commodities. And the more that changes, the more people get access to harm reduction. Um, having said all of that, I think there's another really big 
thing there about kind of using the money that we have available to us in more efficient ways. And I think there's lots to be that we need to work on collectively about greater efficiencies and service delivery approaches. And I, and I, and I kind of want to throw into the discussion some concern I have coming from resource rich background. Um, a, a, an appeal to the kind of uh, <coughs> uh, program specialists and researchers from um, re resource, re research, resource rich settings to kind of remind people about the future of harm reduction in low and middle income countries probably won't be standalone harm reduction services. It will probably be um, harm reduction services that are integrated into primary care or integrated into, you know, HIV sexual health services. Um, more generally, I, I, I think we need to challenge ourselves on things like the standalone OST clinic. Uh, I, I don't think there's much of a future for standalone OST services. And I also want to kind of um, uh, kind of commend those uh, those people in the room and beyond who are finding ways of um, delivering services in integrated primary health care platforms. But also, and a shout out to our Ukraine colleagues, um, uh, people, who, uh, organizations, activists, people, specialists, who are finding ways of kind of of getting harm reduction services much more directly to um, to people who need them, and you know, like we've heard just before about um, mobile, the mobile clinic approach. I think there's lots more that we can do in harm reduction in terms of mobile health services rather than requiring drug users to come to our services all the time, especially on a daily basis, but also much more that we can do in terms of online provision and yeah, yeah provision that doesn't necessarily require drug users to keep coming into capital cities or to large centers in order to get the services that they need. So we're really interested in, um, in countries, organizations, actors who are uh, finding ways to uh, bring harm reduction to an even lower threshold, um, uh, yeah, um, to, to bring greater efficiencies in getting harm reduction products much more directly into the hands of people who need them. Thanks, Susie. Um, just for the last few minutes, we, we've been talking about uh, ways of reducing cost of, uh, of programs and, uh, and efficiencies. Uh, just to go back to the overall big picture funding uh, topic, uh, I'd like to ask um, Finn uh, from the Global Hepatitis Fund, who is not quite in the same position as the Global Fund for HIV, TB and Malaria, if you see any, um, well, first lessons learned of unconventional funding, perhaps, um, for opportunities, and also, um, yeah, unlocking or gardening uh, greater commitments from governments to, uh, to support national funding uh, in addition to the uh, international funding. Thank you. So, no, no, we are in the same position as Global Fund, we are just smaller, <laughs> which is also uh, the funding for what we are uh, looking for, elimination of viral hepatitis, it's smaller. So, just first of all, my name is Finn, I'm the executive director of the Hepatitis Fund. The Hepatitis Fund, is the, the thinking in the first place was to, to become maybe, not like Global Fund, but the same kind of style of fundraising centrally, turning around, open call for proposal, and distribute funds locally, and work together with government um, high net worth individual, corporate, pharmaceutical company, anyone who can be part of this landscape of funding and then directly work on activity with local organizations. And that is still the aim for the Hepatitis Fund. If you don't have all the questions from me now, within this uh, few minutes, I have my colleagues on the right side there, or left side for you, and they have a booth downstairs, so please come and and engage with us and ask questions during the day of the INSU. But what have we done? We have done one call for proposal in 2019. Then COVID happened, of course, some challenges, but successfully concluded 
uh, in the end of last year. So this year we used to prepare for the next call. We had the first ever, I think, resource mobilization conference here in Geneva, 17th of May. Uh, for the first time we had government in the room, we had uh, all the other sort of entities that can possibly fund uh, towards the elimination part. And I think the, the conference as such was, was a great success. The outcome, not mainly there and then as we expected, but what is important to inform you now is that we work throughout the rest of the year and we're coming close to expectation now, which means that in 2024 uh, we open a new call for proposal where all local organization or international organization working on the elimination part can apply in this call. And then of course more information will be to find on our web page. I think what is important, what I realized, I only worked with Hepatite for three years now, but my past was 25 years for International Red Cross on fundraising. So I'll, I know a little bit of fundraising, and especially then uh, working with government. I think the big, big uh, gap that we have, as Naomi mentioned, 10% of, of uh, what we need is because of that. We haven't been able, or we haven't gone to uh, government, uh, we haven't engaged them enough. And I can only talk of, of my own government, I'm from Norway. And when I, I went to see the development organization in Norway for the first time as the executive director for the hepatitis fund, uh, they didn't even realize they didn't fund the hepatitis. So they said, no, we do this and this and this, so we do fund the hepatitis. No, you don't. So, so it, this part of education is very important. Government actually believe they do and they don't. If we don't talk about hepatitis, they will not fund it. There will not be earmarked funding for that disease. Be well aware of that. Number two, what I've seen during the three year is the lack of, I, I'm a little bit critical, so you feel free to dis disagree with me, but there's a lack of professionalism in fundraising. I think the organization that we are working with, all types of organization, that is what I said, you know. Talk to us and we can do the training. So you can do local fundraising. We do now have an activity early next year in Pakistan where we take international organizations like ourselves to Pakistan. We include government present in Pakistan with a development organization or their embassy. We ask corporate in Pakistan, we ask anyone high net worth individual, whatever, in Pakistan to join us in this round table conference uh, in January next year to support, but also to bring in matching funding for what Pakistan government has already done. They announced this year uh, millions of US dollars will go towards elimination part in Pakistan the next five years. As one of the very few government to have done this in, in 23. And then they ask us for support. Of course we do that. But that is like a, a sort of learning or, or let's say the, the right way to go. You bring something to the table yourself and we come with something. We say we bring catalytic funding. We will never full, fully fund anyone. We will say this should catalyze into this. And this is what we've seen and the learning we had in the first round is that you bring some money and they make the money you bring make something bigger. And I think it's, it's uh, for me, it's very important to highlight. It's very easy. But if you ask me what I say, we don't have money. So I said, go, go and ask. That is what most of us don't do. You ask and you ask again. And what we see is that you have hundreds of no but you still continue to ask. Because we all know the funding is there. It's very easy to focus on the, the sort of, uh, let's say, deteriorating situation in fundraising. It's not really true, but it's shifting from different hands. So if you look at the last 10 years, private donors, high net worth individuals, and family foundation have increased enormously. Government have been sort of stabilized or at the same place, which means that the fact of decrease because of inflation, 
and higher prices of everything. So, so you have to, to see where there's opportunity. It's not only with government. There's a variety of opportunity. And this is important, that you take one of the opportunity matching with others. And I promise you, if you go to your government, if you leave this conference, you go home and you talk with the government and initialize something and ask them, what are you doing? Let's see the National Health Plan. Where's hepatitis? Where's the money from Ministry of, Foreign Affair, uh, Ministry of Finance going through Ministry of Public Health into hepatitis? There's a lot of soft commitment in very many countries throughout the world, but it's not actual commitment. I make one interesting case for you. U.S. committed to donate 11 billion U.S. dollar in U.S. only to eliminate viral uh, hepatitis C. The money is still not there. But if you talk to people, people believe this is real money, uh, that you can start to do activity. That is not the situation. The situation is that you have to follow up donation until you have money in the bank, until you can start activity. You see the decrease of number of viral hepatitis in the country that you work. I'm supposed so, to stop. No, no, it's okay, Finn. <laughs> look, I love your passion. Uh, I, I <laughs> it's fantastic. And I think you've provided some really helpful sort of input um, and ideas. And I think it's stuff that people could perhaps take home. I guess I just wanted to end by saying, I don't, look, we never thought that we'd solve all the world's problems in 30 minutes. But I think the important thing is to provide a space to continue these discussions and, and slowly chip away at things as we move forward. So I would just like to thank everyone for all of your time and sticking around. It's still almost an entirely full session, so uh, I hope it was valuable. Thank my, my esteemed colleagues and panelists. Uh, thank you to the co-chair. And uh, go have some lunch. And don't forget that at 1230, there's the session here uh, on cha from Chai around sort of costing. So thank it's on ground floor, sorry, so uh, go there. Thank you so much.